The book of Psalm chapter 51, the book of Psalm chapter 51, and uh, we'll start from verse 1. And just to kind of give you a background of what we are going to look at here today, uh, this is basically uh, the writings of King David when he sinned against God. And the sin basically is that when he committed adultery and, uh, with Bathsheba, and then he killed the husband of Bathsheba, Uriah. And so then uh, when Nathan confronted him with his sin, uh, basically he repented and then he wrote the book of Psalm 51 in regards to that. Um, as you are turning there, I, I just want to point out to you that we had been going through uh, the, an incredible process uh, really a series I believe that we all need, especially today. We need a revival. And I just want to point this out, that revival, again, we need to make sure and understand that revival is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's not something that just hypes you, and you kind of go to different churches and looking for the move of God per se. Has nothing, revival has nothing to do with that. Revival has something to do with this. It is simply a transformation of the hearts of his people. That's what revival is all about. So, because of our desire to have revival, uh, or a transformation of the hearts of, your, of his people, then we began to talk about the importance of humility. I want to tell you today that if you and I desire for revival, the first thing we must have is understanding what humility is all about. We must humble ourselves before God. We must realize that we are so broken, that we have offended Him, that we have sinned against God, and there is absolutely no way that I could do all of this, of, of walking in His ways and obeying Him without first humbling myself before Him. And then the second thing is just being honest. Just be honest. Be, God knows everything about you and me. Everything we've done. Everything that are hidden. He knows it. So he just wants us to what? Just be honest. Because that's part of revival, of transformation of hearts. And so today I want to talk to you about repentance. Repentance. But let me just read uh, the book of Psalm chapter 51. And this is what it says. David said, after sinning against God, he said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from all my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only you, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. And justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you decide faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide me, hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. Just imagine the cry of King David. And renew steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Can you just imagine his cry, he's just crying out to God? Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What a prayer. So, let's talk about this for a moment. What, uh, there's got to be a question that you and I have asked so many times. And one of the questions I believe that we've asked is this question. Is asking God for forgiveness enough? That's a fair question. Would you not agree? Is, is it good enough for me just to ask God to forgive me? Is it good enough for me just to really just say, God... I've sinned against you. I ask you to forgive me. Now, asking God to forgive us is vital. It's important. 
But the question we're asking is this, is it good enough? Now, how many of you have asked God to forgive you and then you go back to your sin? Come on now. So, I've done it many, many times. In fact, in my early Christian life, man, there's a sin in my life. Man, I would ask God, God, I just pray that you would forgive me of my sin and then quickly do it in about an hour. Back to it, back into it. So we're trying to make sense of this question. Is, it, is asking God to forgive me enough? Well, the Bible tells us it is not. It is not. It is not enough just to ask God to forgive us, and then we go back to our sin, and then we ask God to forgive us, then we go back to our sin, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a cycle of asking God to forgive us, we go back to our sin, we, right? Cycle. And so... What is God asking from us then? It is repentance. It is repentance. It's what he is asking. So the question is, what is repentance? Well, repentance, if you look here, is literally means to turn. It is the activity of reviewing one's action. In other words, you're kind of assessing. And God convicts you, shows you of your sins. And feeling contrition or regret... For past wrongs. Um, and then the biblical theology, uh, theologically, uh, uh, definition of repentance is this. Look here. To turn from evil and to turn to the good, most critically, theologically, is the idea of returning to God and turning away from evil. So... This is what it looks like then. According to the Bible, you ask God to forgive you. And then you turn from that sin. And then you turn to God. And when you turn to God, there's a change of behavior. Because God, if you turn to God, you confess your sin, you repent, and you ask God, right? I repent of my sins. Then God comes to do what? To change your heart and mind. There's a change of behavior. So let me just kind of give you a picture of what repentance is. Uh, there's a fine Dutchman. Came into a Christian man to talk to him about God's conviction about his sin. The next morning the Dutchman went to the beautiful home of another man and said to him, Do you recognize this old watch? The answer was, Oh yes. Those are my initials. That is my watch. I lost it eight years ago. How did you get it? And how long have you had it? Well, the guy replied, the Dutch man replied, well, I uh, stole it. What made you bring it back now? I was converted last night, he said. And I have brought it back first thing this morning. If you had been up, I would have brought it to you last night. Hmm. So repentance is asking God for forgiveness and deciding to make things right. It's making a change right away. Now, you got to understand, Brother Gail mentioned this. This is important during our study. you got to understand that you cannot change you. You cannot turn from your sin on your own. You need Jesus to do that. As simple as it is. And how often have I tried to ask God on and on, on and on, to ask me for forgiveness until I realize that I cannot do it on my own. I need right. Jesus to help me. Come on now. Right. Amen. So the question is this, is that how important is repentance? How important is this thing? Well, for John, it's pretty important. That was his message. Repent for the kingdom of God is that what? Out of hand. So you might not be, uh, you know, convinced. Well, Jesus spoke about repentance. He said, repentance, the kingdom of God is at hand. So if you're not pretty convinced still, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3 and 4, talks about repentance. In fact, there are so, there, the message there in chapter 3 and 4, if you read it, it's basically, it's about repentance. So is repentance important? You bet it is. Yes, amen. So 
let's kind of look at David and Bathsheba for a minute, and David specifically. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, he pretty messed up, didn't he? And so uh, here's what we are going to go through right now. What was wrong with David? Well, number one is this. He abandoned his purpose by staying home from war. At the time of, of, of where David, David, that was the springtime when he sinned against God. During springtime, according to the history, it tells us that the, during springtime, the king and the rest of his army goes out for war. Well, at that time, he decided, well, I'm not going to go. I'm just going to stay, right? And he just he pretty much told all his army, go. Big mistake. Because uh, he's supposed to go. He abandoned his purpose by staying home from war. And all of a sudden, Bathsheba was there. Saw Bathsheba. And here's the thing. Number two problem with David is that he focused on his own desires. He focused on his own desires. That's another problem. When you and I begin to focus on our own, our own desires, we will be in trouble. And how many of you know that there are so many desires in us that are not godly? Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> right? So if we are going to focus on our desires, it will, 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 will be in trouble. And the number three problem with David is this, is that when temptation came, he looked into it instead of turning away from it. So how many times have we done that? That when temptation comes, we look into it instead of turning away from it. And number four, number four is that he sinned deliberately. David sinned deliberately. And number five, he tried to cover up his sin by deceiving others. That's another problem. Have you done that when you're like, when there's a sin in your life, you just try to cover it up? I've done that. I've been guilty of that. And number six is that he committed murder to continue the cover up. He killed Uriah just to continue to cover up. So here's the truth. David was exposed and guess what? He paid the consequences. Of his actions. I want to tell you today that God will expose us and we're going to pay the consequences of it. And so, guess what? The impact of this, the impact of David, of what David did is that it was far reaching, affecting many others, mostly his family. I want to tell you today that my wife and children, do you really think that, you know, just my sin, I don't, uh, many of us don't realize the impact of it to our families. If there's sin in my life, I want to let you know that there's going to be a huge impact to my wife, to my children, and to the church. And guess what? It's a huge impact in me personally. And uh, I want to tell you today um, that David was a man after God's own heart. He's a man after God's own heart. He, nobody said it but God alone. He's, he's the man. He's a man after my own heart. So if the guy who's a man after God's own heart fell into sin, who do you think we are? Think about that for a moment. And so the reality is that you and I will probably sin against God, right? We'll probably sin against God and fall into temptation. But here's the thing. Look here. But what matters is what we do after. What matters is what we do after. So going back to what I said earlier, asking God to forgive us is only part of the process. It's not good enough in itself. So we got to make sure that we turn from our sin. Right? And we turn to God and allowing God to transform my heart. That is the process. Are you with me? Now, so let's just look at this uh, Psalm 51 that we looked at earlier. And we're going to learn a couple of things from here. Number one, I've realized in David's life is that when he was confronted by, uh, by the prophet Nathan, number one is what he did is this, is that he was remorseful. So repentance is being remorseful. David was gripped with remorse and repented of his sins. 
When God convicts you of our sins and my, or my sin and your sins, is not to condemn you. Brother Gail said that earlier. But he just wants you to simply agree with him of your sins and to repent of it and to allow him to transform or change your heart and mind. It's not to condemn you. It's not to condemn me. See, here's the thing. When you and I agree with God about our sins, that we have committed and, uh, and offended him, and we realize that. And here's the thing. When we repented of, our, of that specific sin, life, li listen to me, will come back to us. Amen. Now, now say with me. When you continue to embrace sin in your life, okay, and you're not willing to let it go, you're not willing to turn from it, I want to tell you, the closer you get to death. Are you following me? Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is an honest evaluation of self. This is vital. David had an, an honest evaluation of himself. He basically saw what he did was wrong, right? He saw his sin for what it is. Friends, can I tell you something? We got to see our sin for what it is. If we have, you know, if you're one of those people that have said, oh, it's just only a white lie. Hey, I, can I tell you something? A white lie is a lie, and you just got to see for what it is. You're a sin for what it is. You're a liar. I'm a liar. If I'm one of those guys, oh, well, it's just a small lie or whatever, a big lie. If we are going to see sin for what it is, I'm a liar. That's it. If, I, if I've taken that, that does not belong to me from, my, from the company I work for, guess what? Well, that's only a pen. That's a, whatever, just a couple of papers or whatever. It might be just a couple of things, but I want to tell you, you're a robber. That's right. And in other words, what we've just got to do is we've got to see our sin for what it is. There's no small sin or big sin. Sin is sin, and it's going to destroy you whether you like it or not. Right. Are you with me? Yes. And so here's the fun part. The third thing is that we got to look at Psalm 51 is this. is the absence of blame. The absence of blame. David was just like, man, I messed up. He didn't point, point fingers. It is his fault, it is Bathsheba's fault, it is his fault, her fault, blah, 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 right? He just simply said, I messed up. It's my responsibility, right? So we're going we're gonna to play a little game, and we're going to call it the blame game. The blame game. And so I wanted to tell you what I'm about to say are real stories. Well, we're going to play it. So imagine, I want you to use your imagination, okay? So you are driving 100 miles per hour in a 45 miles per hour zone, okay? You lose control, you flip your car on a sharp curve and crit critically injure yourself. Who is at fault? No, not you. It's the Department of Transportation for not making the degree of banking on the curve great enough to keep you on the road at 100 miles per hour. You're going 75 miles, miles per hour in a 55 miles per hour, and you are pulled over, given a ticket that gives you enough points to have your license suspended. Who is to blame? Oh, no, not you. The officer should have been a little more sympathetic to your situation. Now, you are wearing, listen to this. This is true story. You are wearing a shirt that needs to be ironed. Instead of taking it off, you try to iron with it on, and guess what? That's right, you get burned. Well, shame on you, right? But no, it is the company who made the iron's fault, who deserves the blame because they should have warned you that ironing your clothes while they are on your body is dangerous. You pull through McDonald's, for some hot, yes, hot coffee, while trying to drive your car, eating your Egg McMuffin. Then you spill your hot, yes, very hot coffee all over yourself, 
You would think that is kind of dumb, right? But no, it is McDonald's fault for making that coffee way too hot. You decide that you need to fix the electrical component in your TV without unplugging it. <laughs> you begin your work. Uh-oh, you guess it. You get fried. Pretty dumb, right? But no, it's RCA's fault because they should have told you that you were at risk for electric shock. So it's their fault. A man decided to try a stunt that required him to swallow razor blades. He ended up at the hospital for emergency care in a huge bill. He took responsibility, right? You would assume? Absolutely not. You guess again. He ended up suing the hospital for subjecting, subjecting him to harmful radiation during x-rays. Can I tell you something? This is our culture. Nobody is taking responsibility for their own actions. We're blaming everybody. We're looking at everybody. It's your fault. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. It's the church's fault. It's the community's fault. It's the government's fault. It's your fault. And everybody except me. Would you agree that that is our culture? Amen. And in fact, let me just kind of go back in the book of Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 3. Verses 11 to 13. This is kind of funny. It's a funny, funny story. So let me, if you have your Bibles uh, with you, so Genesis chapter 3. This is pretty funny. So, uh, as you know, the God said to Adam and Eve, do not eat of that fruit from that tree, Right? And uh, so you would think that they would obey. Well, they disobeyed. They ate the fruit that God forbid them to eat. And so when they heard God in the garden, they were so afraid because they were naked, so they hid. You would think, really, dudes, you're going to try to hide from God? I mean, <laughs> right? But they did. it. This is kind of a funny story. I mean, you would think that, uh, please, do me a favor. I mean, the Bible... A lot of times, it's not pretty serious. Yeah, they're pretty. Some parts are pretty serious, but some things are pretty funny, and like this one. And so they hid from God, and then, you know, they were like, "Who said? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from?" And this is how Adam responded: "Well, oh, it's the woman. It's a woman you put here, God." She gave me some fruits of the, from the tree, and I ate it, right? So, she, so he pointed to the woman. It's her fault. And then, so God turning to the woman, right? And so the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And so they were, she was like, oh, wait, uh, it's a serpent. It's a serpent's fault because the serpent deceived me. Right? And so they go back and forth with this blaming others, you know, from what they've done against God. And so isn't it funny? I mean, this, we see this, but it's not funny in a sense of this is real. We're pointing fingers. We're blaming people. But this is not what David did. He just said, I'm taking full responsibility for my own actions. This is what we need to have, is to start taking responsibilities for our own actions, right? You stop blaming everybody. It's not everybody's fault. You know what? I could have blamed my mother, right, for leaving me, or why I ended up being a drug addict and always drunk and always gambling, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? I could have blamed her. There were, many of my siblings are blaming mom, right? But man, I've, I'm, I made that decision. To turn to drugs, to turn to gambling, to turn to drinking, because I thought that that was the answer. It was my choice. My mother didn't push me to, to it. It's, it. Can I tell you something? Stop blaming the devil. Yeah. <laughs> Come on.
Come on now. Everybody says it's the devil's fault. Come on now. Everybody, right? Everything is the devil's fault. Oh, God, you know, I'm taking a shower. There's no hot water. Devil, you get out of here in the name of Jesus. You're like, dude, your two daughters just took a shower. That's why you have no hot water. Hello. And so we're blaming everybody instead of owning up to our own disobedience. Come on now. Can I tell you something? The repentance to God is not an option, but a requirement. Amen. Wow. You might want to just write that down. It's right there. Good. Repentance to God is not an option, folks. It is a requirement. Right. Instead of blaming everybody, just be responsible. Don't blame others for your attitudes, your failures, your mistakes, your sins, your misery. I mean, have you met people that are just so miserable about life that he just blames everybody? I want to tell you, do you really want to hang out with those people? Just blaming everybody. And then we got to remember this uh, next thing is that be careful what you allow. Be careful what you allow. Before sin becomes an act, I want to tell you it is first a thought. We call that temptations, right? Amen. Because, uh, before sin becomes an act, it is first a thought. We call that temptations. But what do we do? How do we treat temptation when they come? We got to recognize it. Recognize the temptation. And then when you realize that it is temptation, you ask God, God, I don't have the ability. But man, God, I just need your help. And you turn and run from it. Because knowing that God is on your side, He's going to give you power, He's going to give you the strength to say no to whatever temptation and run. Amen. I'll give you an example. I think I told you this story before. I was working out one day. I know you can't tell, but I do. And so I was doing my exercises in front of this glass mirror, right? And then four ladies came in front of me. Really? I mean, they were wearing this tight, really tight, whatever you call that, pants? I think what, what you call it. They're almost naked. And so, but anyway, they chose to be in front of me and do their exercises bending and all. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God, right? That's, that's all I said. Oh, God. And then I said, the Holy Spirit. I'm like, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need your help. And guess what? I said in my spirit, I love God. I love my wife. And I'm living. And I'm like, how dare you take my place? And I was just bitter walking away. But man, I would just want to tell you that that's, can you just imagine if I, come on out, guys. Come on, guys. You think that this is just my problem? It's everybody's problem. Do you know that the biggest Problem in, 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 with men, number one, is this. is pornography in, not in our nation, but the entire world. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now, now, I'm going to help you out. I'm just going to be real with you, man. I'm going to be real with you. God said that he created not only us men in his image and likeness, but including your woman, women, Right? Come on, women, say amen. amen. I'm on your side. It's good to be on the side of the ladies. I'm smart. That's why I'm always on my wife's side. Yeah. If she's happy, you know, happy life, uh, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> but anyway, let me go back to what I'm trying to say here. So God said in Psalm 139 that you had been fearfully, you had been, you were fearfully made and wonderfully made. Right? Go, follow me. So if I am one of those guys who love to look at women lustfully, well, you know what I'm doing? I'm degrading her value. Because God said she was created in, her, in God's image and likeness, wonderfully, fearfully made, and I look at her like, woohoo, man, look at her. Right? Guess what? I am degrading her value. That's right. So I got to see her as God sees her. 
when I see, you know, when I'm, you know, when, some, when men don't realize that when they are looking at pornography, that's why it is a, 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 it's a great sin before God. Yes. It's simply because God is saying, I have created that woman that you're looking at. And you are disrespecting her value. Come on now, boys. Be careful with your eyes. Let me, let me just say this. If I began to say, man, it's not my fault. Excuses, right? Well, they came here, so I'm already here. I'm, I got here first, so I'm just going to stay here and watch this ladies, right? <laughs> Come on now. And then I began to lust. Do you know that that is the spirit I'm bringing into my marriage? Yes. That is the spirit that is going to linger in my children's life and in their generation and on and on. I'm not going to do that, friends. You cannot afford to do that, man. That's the reason why there's so many broken homes. It's simply because men, instead of being courageous, we are being cowards. Come on, Tina, thank you. The ladies, you love your pastor right now, don't you? Amen. But let me talk to you now, ladies. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what is my point? Men, be careful with your eyes. God gave you his, uh, your eyes so that you can see what he sees. Honor God with your eyes, man. Amen. Remember this, real repentance on the screen, real repentance influences behavior. Real repentance influences behavior. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to just kind of park here for a minute. Have you had a problem with behaviors? I mean, you're like behaving, you're like, man, God, why am I behaving the way I'm behaving? Right? Have you done that? Have you asked that question? So here's a behavior problem. So I have a friend of mine. He was a drug addict. And his wife said, man, if you don't stop doing drugs, I'm going to leave you. And so he was scared. Oh, man, my wife's going to leave me. So I have to stop doing drugs, right? Well, he stopped doing drugs, but he replaced it with something else. Now he's drinking. So the wife said, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave you. Well, so guess what happens? He stops drinking, but he replaces it with something else. Now he's into pornography. And so his wife said, if you don't stop you know, looking and watching th these pornographies, I'm going to leave you. So he was like, oh, man, I got to change. So he stops doing that. Then he replaced it with something else. Now he's into gambling. Now they're out of money. And the wife's like, man, if you don't stop that, I'm going to leave you. So he stops and then he replaces it with something else. Can I tell you something? If you and I are all constantly dealing with behaviors, we are going to be tired because I want to tell you the reason why we're behaving the way we're behaving, the problem is not the behavior, the problem is the heart. Amen. It's a heart issue. The reason why you're behaving the way you're behaving, I'm behaving the way I'm behaving because there's something wrong with my heart. I let God deal with the heart, guess what? The behavior goes away. Come on now, right? So I've realized that because, man, I have some bad behaviors. I'm telling you. I grew up in the streets, you know, were involved with gangs, whatever. I was a cocaine addict and crack addict. Behavior, I was a mess. And then I come to know Jesus. And so I'm like, God, I, this got to go away, right? And then I realized I was just dealing with my behavior. So I got to stop this. And so I dealt with my behavior. Then something comes up. Man, why am I now behaving this way? And so I deal with that behavior. And on and on, I get so tired of being a Christian because I could not do it. Guess what? God finally revealed to me, it's not, the problem is not your behavior. The problem is your heart. And God showed me that 
oh my God. The problem is my heart. Yeah. And so what did I do? I asked God to forgive me. I turned around from my sin. And then I turned to God with humility. And I said, Father, please deal with my heart. Transform my heart. And I put my faith in, in the life of Jesus Christ. And I said, God, I know you have the incredible power to transform my heart. Let me just embrace your life. Let me help you out for a minute, ladies and gents. Asking God to forgive. Have you done this? God, please forgive me, but you're embracing your sin. Have you done that? God, please forgive me. God, I'm asking you, please forgive me, right? I don't want to sin anymore, God, but you're, you're, you're not letting go. You know what it is? I just want to tell you, because you like the sin. You like it. You just got to be honest. I like it, God. I like this sin. Just be honest. You're not fooling God, the fact that you like the sin. And that's why when you're asking God, God, I don't want to gamble anymore, God. But you're holding on to it. Oh, God, I don't want to cheat on my wife. I don't want to lust anymore. But you like lusting. So you just tell God, God, I'm just going to be honest with you. I like to lust. I like to gamble. I like to do drugs. I like this and blah, 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 right? I like it. But I need to kill it. Amen. It has to die. Come on now. I like it, but it has to die. Are you with me? Is this good preaching, folks? Come on now. And so... Let me leave you with this story. A man was praying with this pastor at the altar. Every week he would come up. And it's the same prayer. It's the same prayer. And the pastor is just so patient with this man. And he would pray, Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. Week after week, Lord, I'm asking you, take the cobwebs out of my life. Week after week, finally, the pastor couldn't handle this anymore. Week after week, you come up here asking God to take the cobwebs out of, of my life, right? So finally, he, he gets to the, to the guy. He said, Lord, kill the spider. <laughs> Kill the spider. You and I got to kill the spider. We got to stop saying, God, kill, you know, just take the cobwebs out of my life, right? Kill the sin in the power of the life of Jesus Christ. Do you receive this today? Come on now. Do you think that you can do this alone? No No way. Do you think that sin, man, without Jesus, I want to tell you, you have no chance, absolutely no chance. You need Jesus more than you'll ever know dealing with sin. Do you really think that you can obey God on your own? Come on now, who, who are you kidding? You need the life of Jesus Christ to help you obey him. All of this Christianity stuff, I want to tell you, you need Jesus. I need Jesus in order to follow his ways. That's the bottom line. I can't do it. You can't do it. And so forget even trying. So kill the spider. And how do you do that? Just embrace the life instead of embracing the sin. The sin will kill you. The life of Jesus Christ will give you life. And life abundantly. How many of you received this today? Come on, give him praise. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? I'm going to invite the music team to come up, please.